Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. As we consider what we're going to hear a little bit later on today, Uh, from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. They're coming together in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is just outside, just across the Potomac uh, from Washington, D.C. And we're going to see this Bidenomics turning into Kamalanomics before our eyes here. Important, the White House announcing this morning that Medicare is expected to save $6 billion from the first round of price negotiations. You're going to hear Joe Biden talk about this. It involves 10 widely used drugs, Seniors, they say, saving one and a half billion dollars out of pocket. This is on brand. If you're talking about lowering prices, that's the point of this today. The progress that's been made so far. Tomorrow, Kamala Harris in North Carolina is going to roll out her whole economic package here and presumably give us a sense of where we go from here. And will there be differences in the Joe Biden versus Kamala Harris approach? We don't know. And that's why we're going to be listening But we do want to stop down for an important moment in political history. If you listen to or watch this program, this is obviously important to you, and it certainly is to Adam Hodge. We wanted to bring in Adam based on his experience as an advisor to Joe Biden, a member of this administration before he became managing director of Bully Pulpit International, spokesman, uh, by the way, for the National Security Council. That was his area of expertise in the White House. And Adam, it's great to see you today. Um, You've been talking to us through this whole process of Joe Biden coming to grips with what's happening, his decision to drop out. And now today, it's been a while now. It's been a couple of weeks. And today he'll be actually on a stage with Kamala Harris. What's this going to feel like? I, I think it'll be feel like a really great opportunity for him to pass the baton physically, right? And it, all leading into what should be a very raucous uh, and warm welcome for him sure. at the convention in Chicago next week. Uh, there's an opportunity for him to really help her in some of the areas where he was particularly strong at the campaign trail. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he went to Scranton more times as president than just about any president in history, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think you'll continue to see him uh, al- almost like be the permission structure for some of the voters uh, who were following and who believed and who loved Joe Biden in some of those middle class uh, areas of the country to him passing the torch and say, you can trust Kamala Harris to fight for you just like you trusted me. That is, I think, going to be the overarching theme uh, of his uh, effort on for, on her behalf yeah. over the next few weeks of the campaign. Interesting. How difficult is this going to be for him at the same time? He's addressed the American people from the Oval Office. He's done a couple interviews. But to stand up there and remember what that was like to soak this up, this is going to be one of the last political rallies he's ever involved in. Well, I mean, he's got, we've got 85 whatever days until Election Day. Yeah. He's got plenty more rallies to go. I think the convention will be, in, again, one of those moments where he will feel the love uh, from the, the, the party. Sure. Um, I, I think it's an important moment for him, though, mm-hmm. uh, and for her to talk about their success that they've had trying to fight inflation and lowering costs, right? I mean, and their real economic record that they can both own together. Well, you know, and I ask you that knowing that he may well make appearances on the trail. Yeah. But it's not going to be about him anymore. No, but that's he again. He said when he was running, he was a a transformational uh, candidate. He was going to pass the the baton. Mm -hmm. It may have not happened exactly in the timeline that he envisioned. I think clearly there has been reporting that he thinks he still could could win. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think. It's an opportunity for him to also help hand over the economic record. So 16 million jobs. We saw this week 300,000 clean energy jobs. And you've seen actually what I found fascinating. Her favorability on the economy has actually ticked up over the last few weeks. She's pulled even uh, or close to even with Trump in a lot of the economic, um, who they trust uh, on the economy. That's real momentum that I think captures some of this passing of the torch. Mm. Now it's on her to take it and, pa- and take the baton sure. and run through the uh, I saw that day. FT poll, which yeah. I think you're referring to, which I know was very good news for the campaign. It argues with some other polls that would suggest this is still Donald Trump's issue to lose. He had an opportunity to talk about it yesterday. He didn't say a lot uh, about his economic plan. We got to Hannibal Lecter and all the rest <laughs> of this stuff. What kind of an opportunity does that present for Kamala Harris? And I ask you that knowing there's reporting today. She's going to call on Congress, according to Politico, to pass a federal ban on price gouging tomorrow. 
How specific does she need to be about her plans to draw a contrast to Donald Trump? I mean, to go back to your point yesterday, could not have been a more stark contrast for for Trump. I mean, you got CPI coming down below 3% for the first time Mm. in almost three years. And then he's talking about raising tariffs to 20%, which would, but the Peterson Institute, nonpartisan, said would raise uh, costs about 1,700 bucks for hardworking families. Pivot to tomorrow, she's got an opportunity to lay out a contrast. Like, she is coming out with an idea, a proposal that she thinks will lower costs in the grocery store. Trump didn't say he talked a lot about grocery prices yesterday, but there wasn't really any detail about what he'd do about it. Sure. The price gouging plan is certainly an opportunity to pick up on some of the key messages they've talked about about lowering prices, whether it's Inflation Reduction Act and lowering costs for insulin, prescription drug out-of-pocket costs. Those are all pieces of of their agenda. Um, And it is, uh, I think, also speaks to a more empowered FTC in a terrorist administration. Hmm. There's been a lot of questions about what that... uh, More than a Biden administration? Well, I mean, I think one of the things they signaled was that the FTC would take a look at some of the mergers Mm -hmm. um, in this, in the grocery space. Mm -hmm. You already saw the Biden administration specific to that industry. After we went through the Kroger affair and all the rest. Right. And that that FTC suit is still, still ongoing. Right. So I think that is something that investors and companies should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. She's signaling her intention as this is one area where people actually feel it. And I think that is where it makes part like good politics makes good policy for her in the, in the campaign, they feel like this is a chance for them to drive an affirmative agenda and look yeah. at a forward-looking agenda mm-hmm. as opposed to Trump, who wants to take us back. Your specialty is national security. You were a, a national security advisor, of course, in the White House. And this president has been associated with foreign policy for many years uh, in his career. Kamala Harris doesn't have the experience that Joe Biden had coming into the White House. But there are a lot of questions about what difference there might be in their approach to foreign policy. I wonder what you think about that, knowing that there are going to be a couple of dozen of uncommitted delegates in Chicago, uh, rarely have 30 people made so much noise, who are still upset about Israel policy. These are pro-Palestinian protesters. What should they know about Kamala Harris, if anything that's different than Joe Biden? The important thing to remember, she actually comes into office with one of the strongest foreign policy records of experience than any other president since Joe Biden. Right? I mean, like just at being the vice president, she traveled the world, spoke to world leaders ahead of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm. She's talked pretty passionately about the, the plight of the people of Gaza in this crisis. And she's spoken, I think, very effectively of also about the need for a ceasefire yeah. and also Israel's right to defend itself and the real need to bring the hostages home. She's an effective communicator on these, these issues. I think you're gonna see, and what you, we're all looking and watching uh, with bated breath about what may happen in the Middle East this week. Does she uh, think differently about this than he does, or is it a continuation of what we've seen for the last three years? Donald Trump made the point yesterday that her desk is 10 steps away from the Oval Office. That cuts both ways, depending on well, what you're talking about. Well, but she's been in this situation from, for some of the president's toughest calls. She was there uh, on April 13th when Iran launched hundreds of missiles into the Situation Room and helping give the president advice and counsel. So I think you will see a lot of continuity Mm -hmm. in their approach. And some of the officials who were part of the national security team um, will, I think, likely to stick around, um, who are part of her team will stick around if she becomes president. I think the important, she talks about alliances. She Mm -hmm. talks about uh, rebuilding America's image on the world stage. That's something that Joe Biden invested a ton of time in Yeah, capital, that sounds like Joe Biden. Right? That has part, been part of his agenda. But it's also the right thing to do. <laughs> it is uh, and a way for us to be more effective. Things like bringing hostages home from abroad, that only happens if you have the, the relationships with world leaders. Mm-hmm. The good news for her, she can talk about how she's cultivated some of those relationships while she's been uh, been vice president. Sure. That's her objective, I think, in laying out that vision over the next 90, 90 odd days. Until Paint the election picture day. for me. If we start in Chicago on Monday against the backdrop of an Iranian retaliatory strike against Israel, how does that change the optics, the conversation, and her challenge when she speaks? I mean, it, it will obviously inject uh, an issue into the campaign that it. War in the Middle East is not anything anybody wants to have have happen yeah. because it real it means people's lives are being lost. I mean, like that's a real human cost to that conflict. Um, 
I think for her, it is an opportunity for her to reassert her credentials on, as a, a, a leader uh, for the presidency. And that is something that she has to try to convince the American people. And I have the experience, I have the judgment, which is key, to make the right decisions to be your commander in chief. That is something that I think she has done a good job of so far. Yeah. That's another opportunity for her. I think it more of as an opportunity to show her leadership credentials. Just have a minute left. To what extent will she go to draw contrast with Joe Biden tomorrow when she speaks to the economy? Oh, I, I don't think you'll see a whole lot no. of, of contrast. I think it'll be about laying out where she wants to build on his record. Again, like 16 million jobs, 300,000 300, uh, jobs in the clean energy sector alone. Those are real building blocks to go further. She's talked about the care economy, people you know, paid family leave. Those are all really popular policies. Mm -hmm that she wants to build on. It's not about sort of separating and then putting Joe Biden's policies to the side. Yeah. It's taking the progress and building on it. We'll be watching for that baton today with Adam Hodge in mind. He's managing director at Bully Pulpit, a veteran of the Biden White House. Thanks for being with us as always, Adam. It's great to talk to you. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Thanks for joining us here on the Thursday edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio on the satellite and on YouTube. Join us now. Search Bloomberg Business News Live. You'll see our live stream there with... All of our shows throughout the day, from New York to Washington, D.C., where, of course, we're laser-focused on the economy with more data today. We talked about that with Anna Wong and on the campaign trail. The big handoff today, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris on stage for the first time since Joe Biden decided to drop out of the race. It's been a couple of weeks now. This will be an interesting set of optics before she delivers her economic address tomorrow. I will also note that there's going to be a news conference later today. Donald Trump reportedly in a news conference, you know, sometimes there are questions, sometimes they're not, but we're going to keep tabs on this, uh, of course, for you to see if there's any news after he spoke about his economic ideas tomorrow, along with a lot of other things. And so it is the race to define Kamala Harris on both sides. Everyone knows what Donald Trump's all about, right? Interesting to note, as we listened to him yesterday, in his speech on the economy and many other things, he actually pronounced her name right. He said Kamala, not Kamala, not Kamabla, not any of the other things that we tend to hear from Donald Trump. And I don't know if that's worth noting as he maybe starts to be, take his either opponent more seriously or the advice of his advisors more seriously. Let's get with the panel now. Rick Davis is back with us today. I'm glad to report Bloomberg Politics contributor, partner at Stone Court Capital, joined by Caitlin Legacki, partner at Four Corners Public Affairs, Democratic strategist. Great to see you both with us. What do you make of that, Rick? Uh, does it matter if Donald Trump starts to pronounce her name correctly? Is he actually acknowledging that he has a real opponent? You know, I, I, I don't think we should read too much into it. It may be that he just made a mistake and forgot to try to savage her name, which is sort of pretty much okay. keeping. I mean, you know, I'm waiting for the nickname. I mean, right now she's been nicknameless. Right. I mean, one thing to disparage her name, but it's another thing to not, you know, to be an opponent to Donald Trump, not get a nickname is insulting. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and it could be. <laughs> He's Look, tried a it few. could be some of the complaints that the GOP leaders are giving him about you know, how he's approaching the contrast with, with Harris is starting to sink in. I mean, even just scheduling this press conference today, it'll be interesting to see how much he sticks to the script or whether he does his usual, which is an hour of, you know, misrepresentations, lies, and 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 things like that. So I, I, I get the feeling that there's a gang tackle going on within the GOP trying to get him on a substantive message that will have a result in trying to, you know, sort of hold back the Harris surge that's going on right now. But um, I, maybe we're just reading too much into, you know, a one off. But uh, it's definitely sure. different than it's been, you know, lately. Well, you know, as soon as I go there, Rick, I, you look at some of the other things that were said. Uh, the Washington Post put the executive summary together pretty well, uh, Caitlin, because we were all over the place in this speech. He made fun of President Biden for being pressured to exit the race. 
criticized the administration's immigration policy, attacked undocumented immigrants as criminals, lobbed personal attacks at Harris, and then claimed Harris had been chosen after Democrats, quote, decided to get politically correct, unquote. What does he mean by that? Look, I'm not even going to indulge that conversation because it's so ridiculous. I, I do think he has a crush on Harris. He did say, after he pronounced her name correctly, that her Time magazine cover looks like the most beautiful actress you've ever seen. Um, so maybe things are much simpler than that. Um, but yeah, it's the, I think the challenge for Republicans is that um, this kind of campaign is really unprecedented in modern American politics, and he is clearly thrown off his game by it. But, you know, the reality is that he was supposed to give an economic speech yesterday. It turned into a lot of the same old stuff. He didn't even talk about his economic policies, which many business leaders have said are disastrous. Um, and then, you know, he had um, his opportunity at the convention to, to really set a new tone. And again, he rambled for 90 minutes. I think the reality of the situation is that Trump is an 80 year old man. He's been like this his entire life. He's not going to be able to change his tune. And I think a lot of Republicans are finally coming to reckon with that when it has started to play against them. Hmm. Uh, looks like we've got breaking news on debates here, which is uh, interesting. We know that there had just been a October 1st vice presidential debate uh, that had been agreed to. But this, I'm just learning this with you here. This is straight from the campaign. So let's find out together. It reads, uh, this is from Michael Tyler, comms director for the campaign. The debate about debates is over. All right. Donald Trump's campaign accepted our proposal for three debates, two presidential and a vice presidential debate. Assuming Trump actually shows up September 10th to debate Kamala Harris, then Governor Walz will see J.D. Vance October 1. The American people will have another opportunity, it says, to see the vice president and Donald Trump on the stage together in October. So, Rick, it looks like two and one. It's just like the commission's back in business here, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, this is really pretty traditional format for uh, the modern presidential debate cycle. Um, the difference is the commission isn't involved and they're going to have to, I think, I'm not sure in that October presidential debate, they've picked a host, uh, but uh, you've got breaking news. So it may include that in there. But uh, I actually think it's refreshing that campaigns actually talk to one another and make these arrangements. They don't need a big infrastructure between them. They don't need a lot of haggling over rules and, and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, and I also hope that this is like the first presidential debate. I mean, technically we'll have had three presidential debates this year, uh, which That's is true. kind of entertaining. Uh, and, um, and, and yet, you know, like, I like the fact that, you know, they hold these studio debates and there's not a crowd to be distracting and you can focus in on the candidates themselves. So, um, cross your fingers, maybe the format will stick. And, and I think, you know, we have a chance to see something, really interesting, which was, I don't think anything anybody would have ever anticipated that Kamala Harris and Donald Trump take the stage together and go at it for 90 minutes. It's interesting, uh, Caitlin, weigh in on the idea of another, you know, three debates here, but I find it interesting, the language used in the statement, by the way, no host is referred to in this announcement. Uh, Rick, we don't have a network tied to this one in October yet. It says in October with no other details. But the way this is written, it says, Caitlin, quote, assuming Donald Trump actually shows up September 10th to debate Vice President Harris, then the others will take place. Do they not think he's going to be there? He's a very unpredictable man. Um, I, I think that what it does show is there is a lot of confidence within the Harris operation right now. I think they're trying to get under Trump's skin by baiting him uh, into either lashing out or... Um, becoming a little bit um, more unpredictable. Uh, he, he's, very, he's a very prideful man. Um, and so when they challenge his confidence, they challenge his ability to compete on these stages, it's a very clear attempt to bait him into doing and saying things that are not in his electoral benefit. Um, and it works to some degree. So I, I think that's really what it's about. It's, it's twofold. It's about the confidence and then it's about trying to bait him into doing or saying something that reminds voters why his approval ratings are so high in the first place and why mm -hmm. they voted him out of office in 2020. 
Rick, there seems to be a conventional wisdom that debates advantage Kamala Harris. Should people feel that way? Do you agree? Uh, I don't know. I mean, she's she's the debates we've seen her in, which are not at this high profile level. Um, she's yeah. comported herself well. Um, uh, but I wouldn't underestimate Donald Trump's ability to get under her skin. Uh, I think they are sure. both very good at being incredibly sarcastic toward one another. Uh, and I think a little sarcasm in the campaign is highly enjoyable. I mean, I, I, I think that these <laughs> things sometimes get too too hot and too serious. And the fact that they can be playful. And I think, you know, Harris has sort of introduced that element to this campaign. Uh, her, her boss, Joe Biden, was not playful and, and sarcastic. Uh, and so I think he, he gave away that weapon to use against Donald Trump. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think you'd have to say that the stakes are incredibly high uh, for this presidential debate coming up in September. And, and I don't think you can handicap it in any other way. Like Donald Trump's been on this stage doing presidential debates for a long time. And mm -hmm. and it does not make him nervous. I mean, it makes him crazy sometimes, but it doesn't make him nervous. I would be yes, surprised right. yes. if Kamala Harris takes the stage for the first time as a presidential candidate in a debate and isn't, you know, got a pretty high level uh, of nervousness. Yeah, you've been actually really uh, good describing that, Rick, because so few people will ever be in the room with a presidential candidate before they walk out on stage like that. This is something that no human being can really prepare their nerves for, is it? No, this is uh, this is very stressful. Uh, there's an enormous amount of prep. Uh, at least I'm sure Harris will 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 have a team that will get her prepared for this debate. Uh, and and in doing so, you create expectations. And these candidates, they want to meet those expectations. They want to perform. Yeah. And like a like any kind of athletic endeavor. Um, you're going to have butterflies when you go out on that stage for the first time. And so the question is, how quickly can she overcome that hesitancy that's just normal and get into her paces and remember her attack lines and and, and be able to perform at a level that, frankly, um, you know, regardless of how you feel about the last debate, um, uh, Biden and, and Trump had a lot of practice before they got out there mm -hmm. this year. Hey, Caitlin, we all saw you on the Colbert Report this week. Yeah. Pretty remarkable. This is great. I bet your parents were thrilled. It was from right in this studio when Caitlin was with us, uh, the, the big walls, uh, Kamala Harris rollout and you were professing your love. And I mean that politically, of course, uh, for this choice of a running mate and they were kind of doing yeah. a gag on that. But let me ask you with that in mind in our last couple of minutes, did debates favor Tim walls? Cause he's going to be Face to face, it looks like at least once with J.D. Vance. I think so. I mean, he apparently in his uh, betting with Vice President Harris told her he's not good at debates. Uh, I haven't gone back and watched his tapes from when he ran for governor. But I think hmm. the, the core advantage that he's going to have is that he presents as a super normal guy who, you know, he spent 20 years dealing with teenagers in classrooms as governor, he's had to actually like focus on governing and getting things done. Um, and he has a great economic record to tell. Uh, I think, you know, obviously a lot of the attacks on J.D. Vance are is that he, he's just kind of a weird guy. Um, he has, you know, bopped around from Yale to Silicon Valley, hasn't spent a lot of time since his childhood dealing with normal people in normal circumstances. So I, I think that, um, you know, not speaking to his ability to, to execute a case of, about policy chops, he's definitely going to be able to paint a contrast about what uh, his vision for living in America is, his, his vision of freedom and keeping the government out of your bedroom, keeping the government out of your doctor's office, um, but also building an economy where families can succeed. And so I, I think that, um, you know, when you look at that debate, I think there's a level of security about himself that Tim Walz has that J.D. Vance may be lacking that I think will play in uh, Walz's favor. Fascinating stuff. Great panel today. Rick Davis, Caitlin Legacki, thank you so much. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. 
busy day in politics as well, and that's why you're here listening and watching Balance of Power. I'm Kaylee Lines alongside Joe Matthew. It's going to be an incredibly packed afternoon for the presidential candidates and for current incumbent presidents. As this hour, we are awaiting remarks jointly from President Biden and Kamala Harris about their administration's effort to lower costs for the American people. And then later on this afternoon, we will be hearing from the Republican nominee. Donald Trump will be holding yet another news conference for the second week in a row. This one not from Mar-a-Lago, but from Bedminster, New Jersey. And then, of course, the weekend's Friday with an economic address from Kamala Harris in North Carolina. Yeah, we've got a lot to do before we even get to Chicago. That last <laughs> news conference uh, from Donald Trump did involve questions it did. from reporters, which is the point of a news conference. It also went on for a very long time and seemed to lose direction, uh, kind of like his economic address did yesterday as we got into Hannibal Lecter and all of the other things. We do know, however, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be talking about their efforts to lower prices together. A lot of questions, Kaylee, about whether she can find some sunlight between herself and the president tomorrow. And that's a real balancing act, knowing that this has been a major political problem for him. Especially when she will be with him in Maryland today, having to seem still supportive Correct. of the man who technically is her boss. She yeah. serves at the pleasure of this president but she will also perhaps try to differentiate herself from him one day later. That's the idea. Covering the pivot for us, helping our coverage, of course, is Laura Davison, Bloomberg Politics Editor with us here at the table today in Washington. Uh, Laura, this is quite a, a, a high wire act, we could say, for Kamala Harris. She appears with Joe Biden today, within hours, essentially, tomorrow in North Carolina. She's trying to slice the two apart a little bit when it comes to the economy, right? And what she needs to do, and this remains to be seen if she can do it, is, you know, take all the good stuff from Biden from his legacy of, mm -hmm. you know, the prescription drugs, which is what they're going to be talking about today. That's been a very popular uh, piece of his legislation, you know, the work he's done on infrastructure investments and chips, uh, you know, tie herself to those things, but be able to separate herself from his record on, on inflation mm -hmm. and some of the other things that have been a lot less popular. And, yeah. you know, just looking at the polling, uh, voters give Biden very low marks for for. Yeah. for economic issues. And even compared to Trump, Harris is not polling as well on the economy. Well, and when we heard Trump giving what was dubbed to be an economic uh, address in Asheville, North Carolina yesterday, he did go after the Biden-Harris administration on inflation, talking about how mm -hmm. high prices for various uh, goods have gone uh, during the three and a half years of it. What he didn't do, other than kind of saying, Bill, drill, baby, drill, and we're going to deregulate, was give an explicit policy proposal to get prices down. Are we actually going to get that from Harris tomorrow? Tomorrow? It's possible we'll get a little bit of detail, but I'm sure nowhere near the level of detail that Bloomberg readers and listeners would want <laughs> on this. I've already been getting lots of questions from folks, and I, you know, I'm setting expectations that this is going to be, you know, campaigning in prose and and or campaigning in poetry rather than the, you know, the detailed policy <laughs> list that people want. Um, it is noteworthy, however, that she started to to um, you know dot out some of these policy proposals we saw last night: a proposal on uh, uh, food and grocery mm -hmm. price, price gouging. gouging. She's already talked about no taxes on tips. Another proposal that you know sounds familiar for those who have been listening to Trump's speeches. Um, so we're starting to see little details, but it behooves her to be specific on narrow issues that are popular versus giving, you know, a big 300 page economic policy report where there's lots of stuff that people could find to criticize. Well, she'll have her chance, I guess, in some upcoming debates. One of the things I think you were working on before you joined us uh, was this breaking news in the last hour, at least according to the Harris campaign. There will be two presidential debates, not just September 10th, but one in October. And we now know there will be a vice presidential debate on October 1st. How important will these be in determining the outcome? of this election. Well, if we've learned anything from 2024, it is that debates can definitely <laughs> direct that? the, the yeah. race. Yes. Um, so, you know, this is really important because one of these, the September 10th debate, that first one, will be before most voters start voting. But that October one, depending when that is, um, that's going to be right in the thick of when people are early voting. And this could potentially, depending how this goes, sway uh, sway voters. Different issues could come up. They could be challenged on, you know, if there uh, is, say, a flare-up on, on uh, foreign mm -hmm. policy or something, this is a, a chance for uh, voters to get a sense on some of the issues that, that candidates may want to uh, shy away from on the campaign trail. Well, and it will be certainly a guarantee that Kamala Harris will be answering questions, at least from yeah. the moderators, which we haven't really seen her do much of. This is a point that the Trump campaign has been making frequently, and perhaps that's also why we're going to see Donald Trump theoretically asking some questions at another press conference, the second in as many weeks. Laura, is he just going to keep this up until Harris starts doing 
her own? Or do we know what the strategy is here? Well, part of the strategy is, you know, that Trump, this is a line he wants to use in the attack, is that Harris is not speaking directly to the media, that she's, uh, you know, that she's sort of avoiding them and just going on these scripted appearances. But also this is self-serving in a way that this helps him pull the spotlight back on himself uh, without having to do, you know, some of the, the harder, more in-the-weeds work of campaigning. He uh, has been very frustrated by the media attention that Harris has gotten over recent weeks. So if you can, uh, you know, call a press conference at your golf club, why not? Have press come and, and spend an hour um, talking talking with them and, you know, mm-hmm. at least get some of your your uh, your talking points out there. Yeah. It's unclear how much these are actually helping him. You know, he is arguably, uh, you know, going off script on some of these things. His, com- sure. his comments at the NABJ, you know, were not helpful for his campaign. All right. So we'll see how this goes this afternoon. Laura Davison, Bloomberg Politics Editor, thank you so much. And before we get to Bedminster, New Jersey, in that press conference, of course, mm-hmm. first we will see Joe Biden and Harris together, as we've mentioned, in Maryland. And what's interesting is this is kind of part campaign for Harris, but also part define the legacy for Joe Biden. Yes, he indeed. tries to protect uh, how he will be viewed in history as Absolutely. the 46th president of the United States. And we know that's something else he wants to have his legacy marked by Joe. And he said as much in his Oval Office address after he left the race as peace in the Middle East and a ceasefire deal between Israel right. and Gaza. Those efforts are underway today. Well, that's true. This is uh, time to get to the table here. We've been looking forward to this for some time, uh, Kaylee and Cutter. And it's happening at once as Israel waits for this potential retaliatory strike by Iran. There's some news as well on the war uh, against Hamas here, as American officials reportedly tell Israel now uh, that they can make no further progress Mm -hmm. in the battle against Hamas without further jeopardizing civilian life. We still have hostages involved here and so many questions uh, that we uh, are pursuing at this very delicate moment, Kaylee, we don't even know if Hamas is at the table here, correct? Yeah, they aren't at the table in Doha. It's other Pretty negotiators. Those mediators will be bringing the message back to Yaha Sinwar and the other leadership. So it's on this yeah. note. We turn now to Hagar Shamali. She, of course, is formerly of the National Security Council. Now she's founder and CEO of Greenwich Media Strategies. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Hagar, if we could first just begin with the talks that are happening in Doha, given Hamas is not there at the table and they're still rehashing, trying to reach a deal based on an outline that was announced by President Biden back in May. That was months ago, and the parties didn't agree to it then. Do you really believe that they'll be agreeing to it now? Well, there's a lot of hope. I mean, the White House has expressed a lot of hope. They feel that they're coming close to an end. Now, I know I've said that a few times over the last few months, but it is normal in these types of negotiations for them to be very touch and go. The thing that you've had now is, just to explain is that they've so they've they've agreed on this outline, this general outline that President Biden put forward at the end of May, as you noted, and that outline they remain in agreement uh, in agreement on. But but the way it works from there is that they have to agree on every single little detail, and those details are what what are not only are they getting hung up on those details, but as time wears on, each side comes with new demands. So time is not really uh, on their side on this one, except this time, the there is a lingering aspect in the background, and that's this. A, this potential assault attack that, that 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 we're all waiting for coming from Iran and Hezbollah, and a deal on this ceasefire could actually thwart that attack and put it entirely to the side, which would be, you know, really, I mean, huge and and, and really kind of win win all around. But that said, the details of such, and I can go into a few of them. For example, they're they're arguing on the phases of hostages who should be released, and and you know, first would be women and and and, and remaining children, and then and then men and and soldiers and and so they're arguing over those phases that is, israel doesn't like the phases that hamas is putting forward on that israel wants to have a military presence along the border between gaza and egypt and hamas is now against that so there are things like that israel wants to set up checkpoints inside gaza to uh, check on people to to weed out militants hamas doesn't like that so there are these details that things of this kind that aren't in that broader outline that they're trying to figure out now. And by the way, that's the similar process, whether it's a ceasefire or a peace negotiation. And so it's very common, mm-hmm. but unfortunately, you're talking about two sides who have deep, deep, deep distrust um, on both on both ends. And and Israel's goal at the end of the day is not the same as the, Ameri- as the United States' goal. Their goal ultimately is to defeat mm-hmm. Hamas completely. And I think that they feel that that's not there yet. And Hamas knows that. So they're afraid that even after a ceasefire, Israel would resume some kind of violence. And so that's also in the background here. Hagar, there's a belief that the release of the hostages, still more than 100 living and dead hostages held in Gaza, cannot be secured militarily. Do you believe that? 
Oh, I do believe that. I mean, after October 7, when when so many hostages were taken in, um, knowing how brutal Hamas is and the conditions in Gaza, and I knew that the response from Israel was going to be severe and that the conditions would then worsen in Gaza. I always thought that that their lives were really pretty much the lives of the hostages were hanging by a thread. But I, I think that's especially uh, especially more evident now. And, and And proof of that is the fact that now you have Gaza's entire population, almost the entire population of 2.2, 2.3 million people have been displaced and, and have, to, have had to continue to move many times. And so you have hostages in the mix of that. You obviously have water and, and food issues and medicine issues. And I believe the Israeli government came out saying that, that it's believed that only half or, or a third of those, of those hostages, it's about 115 left, are, are still alive. And so that's why you have increasing pressure inside Israel. You have had protests Today, knowing that these talks are taking place in Doha, the families of the hostages are protesting, saying that they don't want the negotiators to return without a deal. And of course, they've said that before, but they really mean it this time because they know that time is of the essence for these hostages. But the U.S., what they're trying to convey is, hey, Israel, you have defeated Hamas Mm -hmm. significantly to the point where we don't believe they could actually pose a significant threat to you or govern Gaza. And and therefore, it's time to get the hostages back. And and, and if you want to focus on continuing to to undermine Hamas, it has to be with these very specific targeted operations that kill leaders, as you saw in Iran and in in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, And that is, by the way, where I think the war is headed anyway. So that's what the U.S. is trying to convey is, you know, listen, you, you're not going to find any more opportunities to bomb your way out of this. And you're only going to find yourself endangering way too many civilians. It's time to move on. So it's release the hostages and move to the next phase of this. Well, as you allude to the assassinations, the strikes against these leaders in Beirut uh, and, and Tehran, we are still waiting the response from Hezbollah or Iran or both on that front. Hagar, what is your expectation? The longer we wait, does it indicate the strike against Israel, the retaliation is only going to be more severe? Does it suggest one might not be coming at all? The longer we wait, the more it implies that they are waiting to see what happens with the ceasefire talks. Because Iran has something to gain out of these ceasefire talks as well. Uh, you, You know, we have to remember that you have now a huge presence, a U.S. US military presence in the region. And that's been even that's been doubled down by the U.S. uh, Defense Department. Right. Another submarine was sent in. Another carrier was sent in. We have U.S. presence all across the region. And Iran and Hezbollah, no, they don't. They want to respond, but they don't want to enter a war into any kind of engagement with the United States. And they've made that very clear. They want, it seems, a repeat of April where you had 300 drones and missiles launched by Iran. All of them were successfully intercepted, except one or two. And Israel responded, but then every side retreated. And that's kind of my expectation for the, for the next assault. But now, now that we've gone this far, they've waited this long, and we have these ceasefire talks, my expectation is they're definitely holding on until they see how those ceasefire talks happen. And we'll know more at the end of the weekend, because it's really today and Friday that are that are the peak of these talks, apparently, according to the White House, at least. Um, and then if those talks falter, then I would expect this assault that we've all been waiting for to actually happen. But if there's some glimmer of light, then a glimmer of hope, I, I would expect them to retreat a little bit, because at the end of the day, any engagement with the United States, anything that undermines the Iranian regime in general at a time where their own people are against the regime. It threatens the, mm-hmm. the, 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 their power. It threatens their existence altogether. And so they are, then they're aware yeah. of that. So that's what I expect. We're not going to see anything until these ceasefire talks are over. At least we know what direction they're taking. Hagar, we only have a minute left. I don't want to have to cut you off here. So just fair warning. I'm wondering what you're hearing about pro-Palestinian protesters, if anything, disrupting the DNC next week in Chicago. I, I am hearing actually that they are planning on 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 on, pro, on disrupting the DNC. They they tried, I believe, last night. Uh, the vice president was at a, at a fundraising event in the city, and they tried to. It, it became violent. They they threw. They tried to break into the restaurant. They tried to. They they ended up throwing things at the police and 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 smoke mm-hmm. canisters and getting very violent. And I I expect them to try again. And I expect the vice president to put them in their place once again. This is not anybody. I do a lot of work in human rights. A lot of work with activists. I'm yeah. teaching them how to protest effectively, and that is not the way. Mm -hmm. Well, let's stay in touch on that. This is going to be interesting as we head for Chicago next week. Hagar Shamali, always a pleasure to spend time. Greenwich Media Strategies, former National Security Council, 
on Syria and Lebanon with us here. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and radio as we count down uh, to the first appearance, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris together on the same stage since the president of the United States dropped out of the race. They're together today at Prince George's County Community College. This is in Maryland, just outside of the nation's capital. If you're with us on Bloomberg TV or YouTube, you see the stage that has been set lowering prescription drug costs Uh, The language on the signage, the backdrops on this stage, they just put the presidential seal in place. Kaylee Mm -hmm. Westmore, the governor of Maryland, helped to get the crowd wound up before these two emerge. Yeah, of course, it will be fascinating to see the current president and one who is seeking to be president after him joining the stage together as this may be in part legacy defining for Joe Biden, but also an attempt to campaign uh, for the vice president here. And it's worth noting that after today in Maryland, Harris will be in North Carolina tomorrow giving a speech on economic policy, what she would like to pursue. And the question we've been asking is, to what extent will she try to distance herself from the policies of President Biden? Biden was asked that question on his way uh, to this uh, auditorium earlier today. He said she's not going to. (laughs) Well, we're going to find out about that because she does plan to propose legislation uh, that would ban price gouging in the food business. One of the things at least we know she'll be outlining, but still a lot of questions, uh, Kaylee, about what that speech might bring and frankly what we're going to hear today. So let's get into it now with Matt Bennett from Third Way, where he is executive vice president for public affairs as we await the emergence of the vice president and president uh, on that stage together in Maryland. So, Matt, how hard is this line going to be to walk for Vice President Harris as she, on the one hand, tries to applaud the efforts of this administration that she's been a part of, but knowing the negatives that can also come with that may try to create some degree of separation? Yeah, it's really tricky. And I think there's a distinction to be drawn between um, putting distance between herself and Biden on the things that they have done or were planning to do and proposals that she would like to enact going forward. Those are different things. I don't think you're going to see too much distance putting. I think that she will inevitably need to run on the record that they created together, some of which is difficult for her because of the inflation, but some of which is very, very positive. They did a lot of really important and big economic things. Inflation is coming down, jobs are booming, manufacturing is coming back, the stock market's booming. So there's a lot of good things for for her to run on, but she's got to articulate a vision for the future as well. We're going to be hearing, of course, uh, from the administration as a whole here, the Biden-Harris campaign in the next couple of moments. Uh, Matt, they're going to talk about Medicare, expected to save $6 billion. You can see if you're with us on YouTube or Bloomberg TV, the signage in the room focused on this. The first round of price negotiations on 10 widely used drugs. This is a pretty bipartisan message. Who's the audience? Is this aimed at senior voters or is it about more than that? It's definitely aimed at seniors and the people who love them. Um, Prescription drugs are a huge part of the budget Uh, the household budget for many seniors. And this is a big deal. It's billions of dollars, not only in savings for the federal government, but also in savings for people. Uh, And it's long time coming. As you say, it was a bipartisan effort in Congress to to allow Medicare to begin to bargain with pharmaceutical companies, which they were barred from doing for a really long time, that kept prices artificially high. So I think this is very important for them politically and substantively. Matt, as we await these remarks, we've gotten some new polling data today. This is from Pew Research that does show that uh, Harris is leading, although it's very close. We're basically talking a tie here. 46 Harris, 45 Trump with registered voters nationally, another 7% for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But the demographic information was really interesting. 77% of black voters said they support or are leaning toward Harris compared to 64% who said the same about Biden in the last survey. Hispanic voters also favor Harris over Trump by a 17-point margin, especially when we consider the difference in the way these demographics are viewing Harris compared to Biden. Is that really truly at the end of the day an economic story as well? 
I think it is both economic, but also broader. You know, people pick their presidents differently than they pick other other elected officials. They're governors and mayors and senators. Uh, they don't look at a list of achievements. They don't look at a list of policy proposals and match them up. Well, I like this person on abortion and this person on the economy. They make it in a much more uh, holistic way because presidents live in people's lives in ways that other politicians do not. And so I think they a lot of this is simply that they like the energy that they get from Harris and Walls, not just the youthfulness, but but the kind of positivity. And I think they were not loving what they were seeing from the president in that regard. And so I think that's a big part of the difference. I don't think that a major policy shift is what is pushing these poll numbers so dramatically in, in her direction. We're seeing images uh, now of Judith Judy Aiken, a retired nurse uh, who's going to be introducing Kamala Harris. will speak before President Biden, based on what we understand here in the run of show. Uh, Matt, this is quite a moment for Joe Biden as we wait for them to take the stage here. What's going through his mind? Because as of this moment now, it's not about him anymore. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the last valedictory moment where it is. Um, the person who speaks last is most important in politics, and today it'll be him. But next week, it'll be her. You know, he's speaking Monday, and she's speaking Thursday as the nominee of our party. And that's a big deal. And I can only imagine how difficult this is for him, given the way that this all came about. However, I think what we will hear on Monday, especially, is a real summation and, and valedictory set of remarks from him about the things that he and she were able to achieve in just four years with very narrow margins in Congress and against some very tall odds. I mean, they took over with the pandemic still raging, with people dying, with the unemployment rate high. So that's what I think we're here. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.